There, there you it go. Is. Okay. So we are talking about the first five books of Moses. Last week we looked at Genesis, the book of origins. The book of Genesis has two main sections. The first part, the first 11 chapters, this is review from last week. The first 11 chapters are the prehistoric prologue. It deals with four great events in prehistory. And again, pre prehistoric doesn't mean dinosaurs. It means before people started writing history down. The four great events of the prehistoric prologue were the creation of the world, of everything. The fall, um, the flood, Noah and the ark, and the division of nations, the Tower of Babel event. Starting in the 12th chapter, we have the call of Abraham. And from the 12th chapter through the end of Genesis, it is the story of the patriarchs. The patriarchs, well, a patriarch is a father figure, somebody who is both the legal and the religious head in those days of a family. So you have Father Abraham, then his son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and one of Jacob's 12 sons, Joseph, who became the most important because he was the, um, he ended up being sold into slavery in Egypt, and uh, by God's blessing and his own capabilities, he became the second most important person in Egypt after Pharaoh. As we ended the book of Genesis, the Jacob and his other sons and all of their family members, about 75 of them, we're told, had gone down to Egypt to live there and to prosper there because they were under the special care of the Pharaoh. Because their son was the chief, chief operating officer of the whole nation of Egypt, which was the dominant culture in the, in the world at that time. At the very end of the book of Genesis, Jacob has died, Joseph uh, is preparing to die and gets them to promise to take his bones back to Canaan, back to their homeland, uh, eventually when they go back, and then Joseph dies. And that's the end of Genesis, the first book of uh, the five books of Moses. All right. So, as we've talked about, the first five books of Moses in Hebrew are called the Torah, which means the law or the instruction. Um, the Greek name for it is Pentateuch, which means five books, or the five-part book. As we looked last time, I'm just going to bring all these up. Genesis is from creation through the origin of God's people, the children of Abraham. Gen uh, Exodus we're going to look at today, primarily. We're going to look at all four of, the, of these books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We're going to focus most on Exodus. It relates God's deliverance or redemption of the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, all the way up to his establishing of the covenant law. Leviticus sets forth the laws of worship. It's the one with all of the, you know, you can uh, eat off out of a bowl with a, a lip, but you can't eat out of a bowl without a lip. You can eat you know, all the rules. You can eat this, you can't eat that. You then get to Numbers, which is the, Numbers takes place during the time of the 40 years of wandering. And it has to do with the people being first chastised and then prepared to enter the Holy Land. And then Deuteronomy is just as they're getting ready to enter the Holy Land, with Joshua as their leader, because at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. Uh, it is the retelling of the law. Deuteronomy literally means the second telling. And it is a, because they, they got the law at the start of the 40 years of wandering, and they wander around for 40 years, and the new generation has come up. Talk about that. Then the law is restated by Moses. The book of Deuteronomy is actually three sermons by Moses and then some final parting words. And in those sermons, Moses reiterates for this new generation what the law is all about. So those are the five books of Moses. The Torah in Hebrew, the Pentateuch in Greek, the five books. Any questions about any of that it's kind of by way of introduction? All right, let's talk about the book of Exodus. Exodus clearly picks up where Genesis leaves off. It documents the development of the family of Abraham into a people. Abraham was the father of the Hebrew people. Moses was the one who turned them into a nation. The, I'm going to talk about numbers in a few minutes in terms of that 75, uh, Jacob and his children and their, their children, the 75 people who went into Egypt what's become of them in terms of numbers. But a good way for you to think about the Old Testament, they're the three most important historical figures of the Old Testament are Abraham, who we met last week, Moses, who we're going to meet this week, and then later on, David, the king. 
the, a good theological way to think about those is that Abraham was the father of the Hebrew people. Moses became the redeemer of the Hebrew people because through him, God brought them out of Egypt. And King David was just that. He was the king or the, or the governmental leader. So the idea of father, redeemer, and king, Abraham, Moses, and David, those are the three most important figures. And those are the three, from a theological point of view, the three most important uh, archetypes, if you will, in the history of the Hebrew people. One of the ways in which I believe the Jesus fulfills the expectation of the Hebrew people is the Hebrew people after David's time always were looking for a father like Abraham, a redeemer like Moses, a king like David. And they never got it until one person showed up who could fulfill all three of those things. The one figure who for the Hebrew people and for us too is father, redeemer, and king. And that is Jesus. So I give you that so that you can think as we go through this the ways in which the Old Testament really does point to the fulfillment in Jesus. Now I've sworn that for the Old Testament survey and for Old Testament theology, two of the classes we're having now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how it points to Jesus, but some things we do need to hit on. You met the father, Abraham, last week. This week we meet the lawgiver, the redeemer, Moses. Some of the major themes here, we're going to get into the giving of the law. That the nation of Israel really became a nation when they were given the law. In his book, uh, Benware talks about the fact that there were three things necessary for the Hebrew people to become the nation of Israel. They uh, had to first become a people. It started out just Abraham and Sarah. It's kind of hard to have a nation when you've only got the two of you. And so it took time for that people to build up. The second thing they needed was a constitution, a law. Some, some organized way in which they were to exist as a nation. We're going to get that today. And then the third thing they needed, they needed to be a people, they needed to have law, and the third thing they needed was a land. Well, we're going to get to that next week when we get to Joshua, but we're preparing for that this week. So the people who came from Father Abraham, the law that was given through Moses that we look at this week, and the land that was given to them as the promised land that is fulfilled in Joshua that we'll see next week. All right? Okay, let's... The book of Moses, we believe the author was Moses. At least the predominance of it was written by Moses. Uh, liberal scholars say no, but we believe it's true. Partly because everywhere through Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and Jesus himself credited the first five books of the Old Testament as being written by Moses. It's very likely that there are little additions and footnotes and things that are included in the five books of Moses that someone else like Joshua, who inherited the leadership from Moses, may have gone back and added. I've mentioned before that the end of Deuteronomy gives us the story of Moses' death. Well, God could miraculously have given Moses a, a prophetic uh, vision of what his death was going to be like, and he could have written it down. That could have happened. or there's nothing wrong with saying that Joshua came back and filled in some of the gaps later. He was still a man of God, still anointed by God. I, I don't think we, have to, we should have any problem with that. There are other places where it talks about Moses in the third person. Uh, while Moses was still on the other side of the river, for instance, um, he, you know, I guess it's second person, yeah. Um, that probably, you know, the structure of it doesn't look quite right. But still, we believe that Moses was by far the dominant writer, that he, was, he is the one person who's really responsible for the five books of Moses. Okay? Uh, the date is circa 446 to 440 BC. We believe that's the period during which the Exodus occurred. Now, interestingly enough, some of you are going to be looking in your Bibles or you're going to have read something else that says maybe 1528, 25 BC, 70, 80 years before this. Some of you will read, some scholars, more liberal scholars, say that it happened in the 1200s, 200 years later. In fact, um, Ben Ware needs to let check his numbers better because on page 50, uh, 52, he gives the chronology of Genesis and Exodus, and he says the Exodus happened in 1525, 20, which is very conservative writers tend to think that it was earlier, 1525 being earlier. But then, if you go over to page 62, he says Leviticus happened about one year after the Exodus, which would make it 1444. 
So he's got a hundred and, you know, he's what, I'm sorry, he's got um, 80 years difference there, and yet he says one year later. So he's even picked up two different dates from two different sources. We don't know exactly. I believe the traditional date is probably the right one. The traditional is that the Exodus happened about 1445 or 1446. Okay? Now, um, and that it was during the, the time in the wilderness that Moses actually wrote, you know, 40 years wandering around the desert, there's not a lot of other things to do. So that's when Moses actually wrote what we know of as the Pentateuch, the Torah, the books of Moses. Okay? Um, there are some of the discrepancies. In 1 Kings, it says there were 480 years between the Exodus and the fourth year of Solomon's reign when the temple was inaugurated. And so that 480 years is where we get the most traditional uh, interpretation of date, this 1446. Uh, that's when the Exodus happened. There are other dates, I mean, a lot of other things in the Old Testament that are interpreted differently. Some people say it's 480 years because it was a, uh, and a, what's the word I want to use? It's not really a metaphor. The, the Hebrews used poetic sort of exaggerations sometimes. Um, and the, so they say 12 generations of 40 years each would make 480 years. And that's the kind of thing that they tended to do. No, you know, they would use numbers in sort of poetic ways to make a point. There are other places, the Masoretic texts, that the, um, the Jews, um, the Hebrew Masoretic text, says there were 430 years of sojourn in Egypt. The um, Septuagint said there were 215 years of sojourn in Egypt because they interpreted the ancient documents differently. All right? The best bet is that we go with the simplest explanation, which 1 Kings says 480 years, which would have put the Exodus at the most commonly accepted date of about 1446, 1445, right there. Okay? BC. Got that? But there are questions about that. Um, if using the most traditional date, that would mean that the pharaoh, because they're in Egypt, they have pharaohs, the pharaoh that was the pharaoh of the oppression, the one that started to oppress the Israelites, was probably Tutmos III, because we have the history of the, of the Egyptians. They kept track of all that stuff. Um, and then the pharaoh of the Exodus was probably Amenhotep II, some people would say it's Ramses II. You get different, different scholars say different things. It's not critical which one it was, but we believe that it was one of the pharaohs and that this really happened. This really is history. Um, the theme of the book of Exodus is God's deliverance of his chosen people, that he redeems his people from slavery and oppression. The key word there is redemption, that God, acting through Moses, miraculously redeems his people from slavery. He literally purchases, purchases them by a miraculous act out of slavery in Egypt. The purpose of this book is primarily to show God's faithfulness to keep his covenant, the covenant he had promised to Abraham, and as we looked at last week, he restated to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then to Joseph, the restating of his covenant, that he would be their God and they would be his people, that's the first part. And the second part then is he gives specific instruction through the giving of the law for how the people are supposed to live. God is very specific to the Jewish people as to what the expectations are for them. Basic outline, there are five sections to this and we're going to look at key verses. Uh, we have the story of Moses up until the point where he, you know, before the Exodus, uh, or actually before his confrontation with Pharaoh in the first seven chapters. Then we have the story of the confrontation with Pharaoh and the ten plagues from chapter 7 to 13. And then we have the actual act of the Exodus. You know, I meant to bring, in fact, I may be able to find it at the break. I think I have some pictures on this computer. Um, the, the exit signs from when we were in Greece that actually are Greek letters that for Exodus. Exodus oh. means exit. Okay. So exit signs in, in Greece say Exodus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the giving of the law from Exodus 19 to 24, and then the creation of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, and the worship from chapter 25 to 40. But you all read this this week, right? So you yes. know all that. Good for you. Um, this is a way of looking at, um, and there's some charts and things, there's some pretty good charts and stuff in, in Benware's book. But this is a way of looking at six different elements of each of these books. I'm going to do this for each of the books we're going to touch on today, but we're going to spend more time on Exodus. First, the focus 
of the first 19 chapters, or actually 18 chapters, um, of Exodus is the redemption of the people from slavery in Egypt. Then you get the revelation from God of how he wants them to live. Remember I said the two big parts were that God redeems his people and then he tells them how to live. That's the two big sections. And there's a breakdown here, and since you will have access to these today, you can see uh, it shows you where the chapters are. The divisions that you have are the need for redemption, the first chapter, the preparation for redemption, uh, chapters 2 through 4, then the redemption of Israel itself, that is the, the escape from Egypt, the preservation of Israel, that God continues to, to bless them and protect them as they're running from Pharaoh, and then the revelation of the covenant, and the response of Israel to the covenant. When God gives his law, and then the Israelites respond not so well, initially, to the law. Um, in terms of topic, the first big section under the redemption from Egypt is narration, having to do with the subjection of the Israelites, then the redemption of the Israelites, and then we have fairly legal language toward the end of Exodus, which is the, the legislation the, and the instruction. The law, and then what you're supposed to do with it. Uh, in terms of location, it starts out, of course, in Egypt. Then there's the time in the wilderness when they're getting away from Pharaoh and leaving. Then they stop at Mount Sinai, which is where the law is given. And then finally, in terms of time period, again, I say 430 years here. Benware in one place says, uh, says 275 because he's, he's picking a very different date. But generally accepted, 430 years is the time period from the death or from, from the time of Joseph until the time of Moses, okay, and the Exodus. And then there's two months in which they're on the, on the land from the Egyptians, and then ten months that they spend at the foot of Mount Sinai, during which time the law is given and explained, and the tabernacle is, is, is made, and all of that sort of thing. All right? So this gives you kind of a cross-section of different pieces of what Exodus is all about. Um, let's talk about the major events in Exodus. Uh, this is the oppression. The first major event is the oppression of the Israelites. Again, they were um, high hogs at the trough. Sometimes my southern side comes out. Um, they were doing really, really well in Egypt during Joseph's time and for a long time after that. But different leaders come along, different pharaohs come along. And I realize I didn't print this out, so I'm going to have to sort of turn away from the camera. And to read this to you because I want to. This is from Exodus chapter 1, starting with verse 8. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store, store cities for Pharaoh. And we know where those are, by the way, today. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the, on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Now it goes on. I love the fact that we know the names of Shifra and Pua, these two midwives of the Israelites. What happens is these two women don't do what they're told. You know, you want women because women, you know, can continue to, uh, you know, work. Plus, they can have babies. If you do want to have more population, you know, one it's one bull and a hundred heifers is just fine. You know, you don't want a lot of bulls because then you get problems. Particularly since they were worried about them turning into sorry. Uh, the heifer comment had nothing to do with you. <laughs> Sheesh, sensei. <it. laughs> um, and so they were saying, let's keep the boys limited, continue to let the women, because they're not going to be a problem. This was a patriarchal society. Um, and Shifra and Pua refuse. They just don't do it. They're letting all of the babies be born. And then, the right after this, in chapter 1, the Egyptians come back to the two midwives and say, why aren't you doing what we told you? These boys are living. And Shifra and Pua 
smart women. They say, well, sorry, but these Israelite women are like you, Egyptian women, who are really kind of soft and weak, the, Israeli, the Israelite women. They have their babies right out there in the field before the midwife even gets there. We have nothing to do with it. <laughs> they're a lot stronger than you guys, so it's not our fault that they're able to have these babies without us being there. Okay. Well, then they say, from now on, any baby boys that we find, we're going to throw them in the river, in the Nile River. And that's the oppression of the Israelites. So that's the first thing. That sets the stage where it was actually male children were all supposed to be killed. Now, you're going to stop me if you have a question. Yes, Bob. That's a very minor point, but two midwives entirely adequate to deal with two men. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the numbers for a second, and, and you're exactly right. Um, there is a question as to how many Israelites there really were. If, in your Bibles, when you get to numbers, um, you probably read, there. The book of Numbers, the reason it's called Numbers, is because there are two uh, censuses taken in the book of Numbers. They count the number of the Israelites in order to know how many, because they're getting ready to go into Canaan, and they're going to have to fight, fight battles in order to take this land. Even though God said, I'll be with you, still, you're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to fight for it. So they count the number of soldiers, and the first time they count the soldiers, they get 605,000 men able to fight. The second time, they get 601,000 men fight because one is before they go into the wilderness for, and the other is toward the end. So population actually went down when they're wandering around in the wilderness. Okay. But people have said, how in the world could they have an army of 600,000 people? Because the average army back in those days was counted in the tens of thousands. And the Egyptian army, they say, probably was 30 or 40,000. And that was the most powerful army available back then. So if you had 600,000 fighting men, you had two to two and a half million people. And it's been observed that if you had two and a half million people and they're walking across the desert, if you had ten people wide, that would, you know, ten people abreast, that would be 150 miles long. Wow. There are some impracticalities here. So scholars, even conservative scholars, have said, maybe something else is going on here that we don't understand. Uh, one of the things is the word that is used in this passage, these passages for thousand is elef. Well, the word elef does mean literally a thousand in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew, but it also means a clan or a family unit. It was also used that way. It also meant a military unit, and it could be used symbolically for any good-sized number. Right? As I told you, they like to use sort of metaphorical uses for things. Um, the... In the Ugaritic, which was a cognate language to Semitic, I talked about that the other day, we have a lot of Ugaritic documents, that's why if, you're, if you do a PhD in Hebrew at a really good school, you have to study Ugaritic and Akkadian and all sorts of other ancient languages. But in Ugaritic, the word uh, aluf, which is a cognate to elef, means a chieftain, and so it means a family group, you know, a clan under a chieftain. So the suggestion has been made, and we don't know for sure, that instead of it being 600,000 fighting men, it was 600 family groups of some number. And if you apply that, for instance, and it goes, if you read particularly in Numbers, it goes through every one of the 12 tribes of Israel and says there were this many, you know, this many family groups within the tribe of Dan and this many people. But instead of it being in the hundreds of thousands, if you apply this to Dan, for instance, you end up with 60 chieftains and 2,700 men. So if you did that for all of them, then you would end up with a number that was probably more around the 50 or 60,000 instead of 600,000. Now again, that does not challenge the reliability of Scripture. It does not suggest that God was any less present, or God, in fact, in one way, it proves that God was more present and that God was more miraculous in His working, because if they had 600,000 fighting men, there wasn't anybody in that part of the world at that time that could have stood up against an army that size. You know, you could, have, you could have fought battles and killed ten of them for every one of your army, and you still would have lost. So, it's probable that those numbers are not accurate because of a mistranslation of what the Hebrew words for. And you also get little details, like two midwives, who we know the names of, were responsible for, you know, helping bring out the children for all of the Israelite people at that time. But this, does, this is not to question... That's not a liberal interpretation in my mind, it's simply to say, we don't know for sure. 
But it seems like it probably was a lesser number and that there could be very legitimate reasons why that happened in terms of interpretation. Is that fair? Does anybody have a heartburn with that? It could also mean that those were the head of the midwives too. Right, they could have been the supervisors of the midwife. Yeah. You know, that they're, you know, that they were the bosses and they had people working under them. We don't know. It could be one town too. You don't have two and a half million people in one spot. Yeah, well, they, they apparently were pretty well, pr pretty close together because they were doing, they were acting as a unit, particularly when they left. You know, they all left, you know, right away. So they were close enough together that there was real clear communication. There wasn't a whole lot of time taken to, you know, to, to get the word out. Uh, I'm going to show you some paintings and photos. Actually, one of them is a picture from, from uh, one of the, the Exodus movies. And it shows this mass of people, you know, as far as the eye can see, crossing this body of, you know, the dry land in the middle of this body of water. Um, again, just the practicality of it suggests to us that probably what the numbers were probably inflated because of a misunderstanding. That does not do anything to negate the reality of the history, the reality of God's presence, or his miraculous deliverance of the people. Okay? And sometimes if we twist our tails too tight in order to try to argue for something like that that we're not sure about, we don't do ourselves justice, and it's not a good witness to other people. Okay, somebody who doesn't, who does not understand or accept the faith or believe it. You know, if we plant our flag and bang the table, adamant that there had to be six hundred thousand fighting Israelites, and therefore two to two and a half million people walking across the desert, you're liable to get non-believers going, "I can't buy that." You know, and you blow the whole deal for them. When sometimes, if we're willing to say, you know, we don't know about that, that could be a mis misinterpretation. It doesn't change the, the the core point of the story. We're going to talk about crossing the Red Sea in a few minutes. Um, and was it? What, where was it? There, there are serious questions about where did they cross? Because we don't know for sure. There are serious questions about where Mount Sinai was. There's at least three different locations that scholars, including conservative scholars, argue for. We'll talk about that, okay? Um, any question about that? I have a comment. Is it possible that God did that on purpose, not wanting us to focus on that is Mount Sinai? Well, I think probably so. And we, we said that before when we were talking about creation. That if, if it were a big enough deal that we should be tearing our insides out over whether it was six literal days of, that God created and seventh day rested, or whether it was whether that represents an age or a period or whatever. If it were that important, it wouldn't be unclear to us. And so if we lack clarity on something like that, then maybe that's because this was not something God wanted us to focus on. And here we are, silly people that we are, you know, silly creatures that we are, taking all the stuff we don't know about and trying to spend all our time talking about that. So focus on, focus, focusing on the things we do know that God gave us as critical to our faith in Him. Alright? Okay. Uh, so the first is the oppression of the Israelites. The s second major event, and, the, and there's quite a few of these compressed right in the front end because God is setting the stage here. And there's several pieces that have to be in place for the great act of redemption to happen. So the second major event, um, and these are my choices for what are major events, is the birth and preservation, I call it, of Moses. From Exodus 2, starting with the first verse. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Remember, the Egyptians have just said any male child, they're going to throw him in the Nile River. So she's hiding him to keep him from being killed. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket. Remember papyrus, those reeds that they made writing paper out of? She got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Her sister stood at a distance, I'm sorry, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. This is Moses' sister, Miriam. When Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. They knew from the start that this was a Hebrew boy. Skip down just a little bit uh, to verse 10. When the child grew older, uh, what happens in here is um, Moses' sister Miriam goes running up and says, well, I know a wet nurse. You know what a wet nurse is? Back in the old days, a woman who, you know, wealthy people especially would have somebody else nurse their children. And so a wet nurse was somebody who had 
breast milk and could feed a baby. So Miriam runs up, smart girl, and says, uh, I know a Hebrew wet nurse that could take care of this baby for you. It's Moses' mother. Who just, you know, who still has breast milk because the baby's only a few months old. So Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, let's do that. So Miriam takes the baby back to Moses' mother, and the mother is taking care of the baby with the permission and protection of the daughter of Pharaoh. Then, when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Moses sounds like the Hebrew to draw out. Okay. So, this was the miraculous intervention that God made in order to preserve the life of Moses as a baby. Not only to preserve it, but to have him raised in the household of the Pharaoh, so that he had the best education possible. He learned what it meant to be a leader. He had all the advantages of growing up in the household of the king. Gene. Yeah, how about including the chronology of where circumcision comes into this? I mean, could that be the way that she knew he was a hero? Or did circumcision come after him? No, circumcision came at, with Abraham. So that's a long time before this. Yeah. Hebrew boys would have been circumcised. So she would have been able to tell, from for that reason, that Moses was Hebrew. Or probably the idea that it was a baby boy who was floating around in a basket in the river <laughs> suggested that this was, you know, there was something going on here. They were trying to hide this baby. So it could have been either one of those. But yes, Hebrew children would have been circumcised because that was a that was a covenant made with Abraham quite a long time before, you know, six hundred years before. Okay, um, five to six hundred. years. The numbers all run together in my head sometimes too. So. So, Moses, born, specially preserved and prepared by God. The third major event I think we need to look at in Exodus is the flight of Moses to Midian. Now remember, he was recognized at the very start as being Hebrew. He grew up knowing that even though he was, he was an adopted child in the household of Pharaoh, he knew he was a Jew. He knew he was Hebrew. And we have this story from Exodus 2 just, just right after where we were. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Actually, he was ruler over them as the adopted son of Pharaoh. Um, are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now remember, this isn't actually Pharaoh's blood. This verse, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, suggested to me, suggests to me, that even though the daughter of Pharaoh had adopted Moses and he'd grown up in that household, his adopted grandfather wasn't too keen on this, having a Hebrew who is his, you know, in his household. And so now he's got a reason to try to do something about it. And so Moses runs for it. At this point, when it says Moses had grown up, um, other, other references suggest to us that Moses' time in Egypt was up until his 40th birthday, up until he was 40 years old. He flees to Midian, which is an area that was both part of the Sinai Peninsula, which is east of uh, Egypt. We're going to look at some maps here shortly, uh, not right now. And it was part of the Sinai Peninsula and part of Arabia. And so that's the land of Midian it was called. So that's where he goes to, and he sits down, and we have this wonderful story. He sits down, and a young woman comes over and asks if he wants something to drink. Her name is Zipporah. He gets a crush on her. She introduces him to her father, Jethro, and he ends up taking care of Jethro's flocks and marrying his daughter. So Jethro becomes his father-in-law. The next major event that we need to look at is the event of the burning bush. During this time, part of what, what it meant, since this is desert land, you didn't keep your crops, your uh, herds, be they sheep or whatever, you didn't keep them in a pen. You had to wander around to where there was grass. And so 
since he was taking care of the flocks, that meant that Moses would be out in the desert, in the wilderness, wandering around with these animals. So we have from Exodus 3 this passage. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. I think I might be able to see it on the screen. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. It's not something you see every day. <laughs> when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Moses sees a miraculous thing, a bush in the desert that is burning, and this is near Mount Horeb, and goes over to check it out, and God speaks to him, and he identifies himself. Remember we talked before, or was it in the theology class, that God is a personal God, and he often identifies himself as having been the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That he is a God who has relationship, and in this case, with Moses' predecessors, and the family of the people of Israel. Okay? So, the miraculous appearance, and this continues with the call of Moses, and when God identifies himself with a proper name. This is Exodus 3. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and, and skipping down a little bit here. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Remember, he ran forth because Pharaoh wanted to kill him in the first place. And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Mount Horeb is the same as Mount Sinai. Okay. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Those of you in the Old Testament theology class, we've spent quite a time talking about what that means. This is the proper name of God from this point forward in the history of the Israelites. Um, I am, literally the four Hebrew letters, which we transliterate, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. It, 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 it's a version of the, it's a form of the verb to be, and it means I am. Not I am anything, I am completely self-sufficient. I am non-contingent. God is saying, I do not rely on anything. Um, I, I, I don't need any descriptors. I just exist. I am the God. Okay. It's a critical understanding about the nature of God that he gives his proper name as being a very word that means I am non-contingent, don't rely on anything else, I am eternal, I am self-sufficient, and I alone am. So God names himself, and he calls Moses to be the one to bring the Israel, Israelites out of their captivity. Then, Moses finally agrees to do it. We have some back and forth where Moses says, yes, but I don't talk very well. And God, God goes, sheesh. Well, okay, I'm adding a little bit. But God says, all right, if you're going to be picky about it, I will send your brother Aaron, who speaks very well. You will be the leader. He'll be the mouthpiece. He'll do the talking for you. Moses is still the one that's in charge, the one anointed and called by God. But Aaron who will become the father of all the priests. You'll notice, you noticed earlier that Moses and Aaron, his brother, and Miriam, his sister, were all from the tribe of Levites, which was the priestly tribe. So when Aaron becomes the first priest, 
of the Israelites in terms of formal worship later on with the tabernacle and all, then that's following through with the idea that God had anointed the Levites as being a special a special group within it, that the children of Levi, a special group within the, the Israelites. When Moses goes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh does not respond. He says, absolutely not, you can't go. And he sort of waffles back and forth. And it says in a couple of places, and God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, so he would not let the people go. You read that and you go, what? I, can, I thought God wanted him to go. What's he hardening the heart of Pharaoh for? Well, if it had been easy, there wouldn't have been any miracle involved. And as it was, there were a number of miraculous demonstrations of God's mercy and of his power and of his redemption. And so the hardening of the heart of Pharaoh was to create a condition whereby when the Israelites did get to leave, everybody knew that this wasn't just a matter of course, that something special is happening here, something miraculous, something truly of God. Michael? Do we have a change in Pharaoh's here in history between the time that uh, Moses fled and then comes back? Because now it doesn't seem... We did. It's, like... it's, it's 40 years later. He spent 40 years working for Jethro. So uh, when I said earlier, yeah, you think Pharaoh tried to kill him, it wasn't the same Pharaoh. Okay. But he clearly would not have been in favor with the Pharaohs you know, at that time, because it would have been, it was the, probably the grandfather at this point. It was 40 years later, it would have been either the father or the grandfather. Right. So we, be we believe that the, the Pharaoh of the oppression was Tutmos III, and that the Pharaoh of the Exodus, which we have here now, was uh, Amenhotep II. Okay. So it was a different Pharaoh. And uh, Moses' life lays out pretty cleanly in 40-year segments. He died when he was 120. Remember, people lived longer back then. Um, Carolyn's dad should hit 120 if he keeps going the way he is. But, um, he was 40 years until he had to flee Egypt and go to Midian. He served his father-in-law, caring for his flocks for 40 years. So by the time he comes to Pharaoh to try to get Pharaoh to let the people go, he is now 80 years old. And then 40 years in the desert, he dies at 120. So three segments of 40 years in Moses' life. So he comes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. At first they do this thing about, well, just let us go out into the desert. And, uh, you know, he sort of tries to trick him. Let's just go out in the desert to worship our God. And he goes, okay, you can go, but you can't take anything with you. And he goes, no, we have to take our animals because we have to have animals for sacrifice. And, and the Pharaoh says, no, you can't. And at first, a couple times Pharaoh says, well, okay, no, but... No. Okay. Um, it finally comes down to God proving that he's serious about this to the Pharaoh and proving to the Israelites that there is a miraculous thing happening by the ten plagues. The first plague that happens is, and Moses warns, uh, in fact, there, there are, uh, they go in cycles of three plagues that get warned about and then a fourth one that doesn't. And then three plagues that get warned about, and, you know, so it varies. And I think there's a chart in um, Benware's book on that. The first plague, the Nile is turned red, turns to blood. Um, the second plague is a plague of frogs. Frogs everywhere. Frogs in the beds. Frogs being stepped on. Um, the third plague is a plague of lice and gnats. I commented earlier that the, early on, the, these things were happening, and Pharaoh would call in his magicians and say, well, can you guys do that? And they go, oh, sure. So they would do something that looked the same. And so Pharaoh would go, Pfft big deal, Moses, I got guys can do that, and he's not convinced. Well then, after the frogs, they come to lice and gnats, and the magicians start having trouble with the gnats. Okay. And then it is a plague of flies, and then it is a plague of disease on cattle, which were critically important to the Egyptians, their cattle. Um, in fact, Egyptian cattle is a, is a particular breed. Uh, then you get in Exodus 9, uh, or I'm sorry, in Exodus 9, 8, Boils and sores both on people and animals. It's getting nasty here now. Then um, hail destroys crops and cattle. Pharaoh's getting warned. Then locusts come and destroy crops. I've never been in a, in a locust swarm, but I've seen photographs where the sky is blotted out. Millions and billions of these grasshoppers fly in and destroy everything. Okay. The last one, they, they had pictures of one in the 60s, I think, in part of Egypt. They had a locust swarm that literally blotted out the sun. I've seen some photographs from that. 
Then you had uh, the curse of or plague of darkness. And finally, the last plague is the plague of the death of the firstborn, the death of the firstborn of every animal and of every human family. The firstborn of Egypt dies, Pharaoh's son. Now, at that point, um, you know, having read this, that when, the, when death, often we call it the angel of death. It doesn't really say that. It just, it says, at one place it says God comes through, at another point it just says death comes through. The Israelites are told they are to sacrifice a lamb. They are to take the blood of that lamb and brush it on the doorposts and the lentil of their doors. And when death comes across, when it sees the blood of the sacrificed lamb on the house, death would pass over that house and not take the firstborn. That's where we get the word Passover, folks. Death passed over the homes of those who had the blood of the sacrificed lamb on the, on the doorposts, right? So the Israelites were not afflicted by this death of the firstborn. At that point, Pharaoh says, enough, get out, leave. And in fact, it says that God miraculously um, moved the hearts of the Israelites to give them gold as they left. They left with gold earrings and necklaces and bracelets and all kinds of stuff. So they took bo booty with them as they left. Right? And it, it may have been just like, here, take this, get away, get away from us. You know, the firstborn of, of our, every house is dead. Um, so leave. So they take off. As they leave, um, after they leave, Pharaoh changes his mind again. And he realizes that all of our workers just left. We can't have that. Let's go get them. Right? So the next major event, while the Israelites are escaping, they come to the Red Sea. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but let me give you the verse related to that. <clears throat> then Moses stretched out his hand. Now they come to the Red Sea, this body of water, and they're being pursued by the Pharaoh and his armies and his chariots. Again, the Egyptian army was the most powerful army in the known, the known world at that time. Well, I guess it would be in the world. If it wasn't known, they would have had armies. So the most powerful army in the world, um, they're being ch chasing the Israelites. They come to this body of water. And we read in Exodus 14, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire, because as they're leaving, he is in a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. The Lord is with them in those forms. Looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. You ever heard the expression, oh yeah, the wheels really came off. <laughs> and the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. A dramatic act of redemption by God. Charlton Heston holds his hand out in the water. <laughs> Waters roll back. Now, let's talk about this. Uh, well, first, let me give you a couple of images. You know, this, obviously, this dramatic scene has been painted and you know represented so many different ways. Um, here's the one. This is from a movie. That's probably it would have been much longer than that if they actually had 600,000 men and plus you know two to two and a half million people total. Um, this is an Egyptian engraving of one of the pharaoh's soldiers and uh, chariot. You remember me saying that horses were always used for war. They were either ridden in war or they were used for chariots. Nobody rode a horse for any reason other than for war. If you rode an animal to do anything else, it was a donkey or you walked. Horses always mean war in the Bible. 
And this is an idea of what it would have been like. Archers on chariots. These were the tanks of the ancient world. All right? And they destroyed other armies with these things. Now, let's talk about the red crossing of the Red Sea. The first thing for us to say unequivocally is that this really happened. It happened miraculously. God preserved and protected the fleeing Israelites against the army of the pharaohs. We believe that unequivocally. The fact is, we don't actually know where the Israelites crossed the sea. And you go, well, they crossed the Red Sea. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, this is the traditional view of the Exodus. They started out, Ramses, Sukkoth, these are the, some of the cities that uh, they helped build. They, the traditional view is they left from here, they headed south, and then you know, took a turn, and that they crossed this northern end of the Red Sea. This is actually uh, the, the Gulf of Suez. All right? Today, the Suez Canal connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea that way, so that you can go through. Yes? Uh, there has been a recent archaeological report that they think they have found it's really a sandbar. I'm going to talk about that. Oh, okay. So this is the traditional idea that they crossed the Red Sea here. They went down, that this was the location of Mount Sinai, and then later on they go up to Kadesh Barnea, and then uh, wandered around for 40 years, <laughs> back down to Ezion Geber, and then up to Moab and cross over the, to enter the Promised Land at Jericho across the Jordan River. Okay, that's the traditional view. One of the problems that comes up with that is Red Sea... That translation, uh, the Hebrew word is yam suf. Suf actually does mean read, not read in Hebrew. And so modern scholars have said, well, it was the reed sea. There are no reeds in the Gulf of Suez. It's salt water, the plants don't survive there. So other theories have been proposed as to where they actually would have crossed this water. Some people have said that they crossed one of the great lake, the lakes here, and they're at the... In ancient times, there were larger lakes along this area, and as they're headed from Egypt over into the, the wilderness, the desert of sin. Some have proposed that there are bodies of water up here that are part of the Nile Delta, and that they, actually the most direct route that they could have taken to the desert of sin, to the wilderness they were headed to, would have been what was called the King's Road, which would be to go up here and to follow the coastline. And so some have said they may have crossed over a body of water there, right? Uh, it doesn't really matter which body of water they cross because we believe that at that body of water God did a miracle. Okay? Someday we'll know for sure. The thing that Dave was just referring to, and let me see if I can, is, now this, this is where we, uh, let me try to relate these two because it's a different perspective. This point here, this is the Sinai Peninsula. This is Arabia. Okay? This is Egypt. This this is the Sinai Peninsula, Egypt, Arabia, okay? A latest uh, proposal is that, and, and all of this is part of the Red Sea, this is the Gulf of Suez, which now is connected to this Mediterranean by the Suez Canal. This is the Gulf of Aqba, and, you know, the Gulf of Aqba is frequently where we put aircraft carriers when somebody in that region is acting up, okay? We send an aircraft carrier task force, and they go into the Red Sea, and they go up into the Gulf of Aqba, where you know, uh, they just make it known, hey guys, don't mess around. Well, the latest theory is that when they left here in Egypt from Goshen, Ramses, Sukkoth, instead of crossing here, which is what that other chart said, and coming down here to Mount Sinai, Horeb, because we don't know for sure where Mount Sinai was, there's a question, that instead they crossed directly over here to this area and crossed, instead of crossing the Gulf of Suez, part of the Red Sea, they crossed the Gulf of Aqaba, part of the Red Sea, all part of the Red Sea. And that crossing here, archaeologists have found chariot wheels. There's an area there where there are sandbars pretty far out from both shores, so that there's only the very middle part that's deep. And so conservative archaeologists now are saying they believe that instead of crossing the Red Sea up here, they actually crossed the Red Sea here, and there is another mountain here, Jabal Allahs. This is the, the mountain down here is called Jabal Musa, which means the mountain of Moses, traditionally. But we don't know for sure where it was. 
There's another mountain here, Jabal Allah's, where they have found suggestions that that may have been Mount Sinai. And then, again, traditionally, they're down here at Mount Sinai, and then they go up here to Ganesh Barnea. But they could have crossed over here to Mount Sinai, a different location for Horeb or Mount Sinai, and then gone this way, up through, because both this and this were considered part of the land of Midian. The Sinai Peninsula and Egypt both were included in what was called Midian, because it was all just desert. I mean, it's the wilderness of sin, or the desert of sin, um, in there. Okay? Could they have crossed that area in one night? Because that's what the... Well, if it was dry, yeah. I mean, that's the suggestion is. This, this is the perspective on this is kind of weird. But, yeah, the, the implication is that they, they could have crossed probably just as easily there as they did here. Is that now called Hormuz? I don't think so. I think Hormuz is somewhere else. But I'll have to check that. That's a good. I know the Gulf of Hormuz, but I'm not sure where it is. I'll, I'll have to look into that. Does anybody know? It's not there. That's okay. right. It's in the aircraft carrier. Yeah. Well, sometimes they, they've actually had them in Aqua too. Um, but we'll check on that. Um, so whether they took, I'm going to go back. No, it's, it's Gulf, the Gulf is farther south. Yeah. Okay. okay. Because there's another narrow part farther south near near where all the pirates are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. The, so the suggestion is they could have taken the northern route and crossed something here up to uh, Kardashian Barnea. Uh, Bar they could have taken the southern route here and crossed the Red Sea here. Or they could have taken a middle route, and either they crossed a body of water here that was the Reed Sea, or they took the middle route and they crossed here at the Gulf of Aqaba. We don't know. That so, seems a really long way for the Egyptians to pursue them. Yeah, uh, they, they were pretty mad. <laughs> um, we don't know, but we don't have to know, because we do believe, and we believe the record, that um, God performed a miracle in protecting and preserving the Israelites, whichever body of water it was they were crossing. Okay. Now, some people have said, uh, well, the Egyptians, there's no record in the Egyptian archives, and the Egyptians had writing, and they kept track. That's why we know about all their kings and the exploits of their kings and the countries they conquered and all that. They said, they were, the liberal scholars say, there is no record in the Pharaoh's um, chronicles of this thing happening. Well, does that surprise you? Yeah. You never read about defeats. No kings back then ever made any note of it if they got defeated, especially if they got their their heinies kicked by this little group of people who were slaves until a week ago. You know. So yeah, that's not surprising. And you'll hear scholars say that that well, there's no record in the Egyptian chronicles. Well, there wouldn't be. They wanted to forget this after it happened. Okay, first. Yeah. So how long was it before the Pharaoh went after. Well, he started out immediately, and um, I believe. How long was it after? Here, how go. long did they go? Because when they took off, because I have a little map right here. Yep. In my Bible, and it's it says it's like 50 miles. From, so I'm guessing if like it would have been from where they started. They would have gone at least 50 miles from the first part, and if they went from where the other place was, that's over 150 miles. Right. Well, this so, took, you know, we have a period, the whole time they took between when they left and when they got to Mount Sinai. No, we I'm believe, just talking about getting well, to Well, Billy, the, the whole time was two months, and so there would have been probably at least, at least several weeks in there that they're running for it. And again, Pharaoh, you say, well, it was an awful long way for him to chase them. His whole economy is now running away from him. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about about him going after him. I'm talking about how much time they've got all those people right. running before he gets to them. Right. Well, so, and you're talking about a lot of people mm -hmm. with wagons and little kids. And, wow. So they can't go that fast right. and chariots coming after them. So, well, we, I don't know. I don't know any more exactly than, than we're talking probably several weeks between the time they left and the time that he caught up with them, okay, that they're running for it. So um, we believe that the total time from when they left to when they got to Mount Sinai, and I, I can't even refer to anything, you know, 
that's what the there's scholars no, say. No. I have no. There's nothing that says exactly how much time in the scripture. But we've got two months in there, um, and I, I'd have to do some research to come up with any more specific math. Can scholars, you, can you get back to this? Yeah, scholars have a sense that's two months. <laughs> sure, I'll look that up because that's really theologically significant. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that the, part of the reason it wasn't recorded either, the army left and they never knew what happened to it. Yeah, they didn't come back. Nobody survived. And that would no. be the end of one pharaoh and the beginning of another. Exactly. And in fact, it would have been the start of a pharaoh that they weren't expecting to have to make pharaoh because it would have been the second son. The first son died. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, but Gad, the point here is that God, God redeemed them out of slavery and then he, he provided for them protection whichever route they took, and there are several other uh, options in terms of Mount Sinai, whether it was Jebel Musa down here, whether it was the Jabal Alaus here, there's another mount up near Kadesh Barnea that they think some people, scholars claim might have been uh, Mount Sinai, we don't know. Okay. I have a question about, it said that what exactly the Egyptians said, and how would they have known what he said, what they said exactly if they were were they really close to them so they could hear them screaming like that God is on their side like how did they know yeah I don't know it's a good question uh, well again we believe that part of this was a miraculous you know, delivery of message to Moses to capture some of this he may have been able to hear some as well obviously anything that happened when he was in front of Pharaoh he knew because he's he was there to hear it and he wrote it down what he what the army was saying or whatever I don't really know I can't claim now the answer to all Interesting. You, you we'll find out someday. Again. We'll get back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's keep going here. Then they get to Mount Sinai. They've been protected by God. Actually, we're going to take a break before we do the Ten Commandments. Um, it is ten minutes after two. We're going to take just a five-minute break, comfort break. We'll start back at two fifteen. In the Exodus is obviously the giving of the law. After escaping Egypt, after crossing the Red Sea, or the Reed Sea, or whatever it was, the miraculous event of God's preserving the Israelites, they get to Mount Sinai, also called Horeb, which is the same place that Moses had seen the burning bush. They get there, the Israelites camp out at the bottom, Moses goes up and meets with God. Now, God says, you can't see my face, but at one point, as an act of uh, intimacy, of friendship, Moses is allowed to see God from behind. God puts him in the cleft of a rock and covers him with his hand, walks by, and then Moses gets to see him as he goes by. We don't know exactly what that means because God is spirit. But the point of that story is to say that this was the, the affection and respect that God had for Moses, that he alone would have to have a chance to experience that. And here's a fun one for you. In, um, in the Pentateuch, it talks about Moses when he came down off the mountain. After having experienced God, that rays were coming out of his face. Right? That he, he was radiant. In fact, at one point it says he had to cover his face because he was glowing. Well, the Hebrew word for rays of light like, is very similar to the word for horns. <laughs> and in medieval times, they misread that. And if you look at statues in Europe, especially, of Moses, he has horns. He'll have his horns. Because they misread that passage. Instead of him having rays coming out of his head or off, off of his face, they, had, they think he thought he had horns. Just a little fun piece. Um, so Moses is given by God the Ten Commandments. And they are, of course, Exodus 20 is where we find them. Most of you attend our church and just heard me preach a whole series of sermons on these things. You will have no other gods before me. You will not make or worship idols. And as I told you earlier, um, I think I told this. Did I tell this class? Forgive me for confusing them, but they're, these, this and the theology class are so close together. I believe that, and not just me, but I, uh, that the ancient Israelites were not monotheistic. They were henotheistic, which means... They selected one God to worship, but that they believed there were other deities. We have all sorts of passages, like when, when uh, Jacob and his, his household flee Laban, his father-in-law. 
His wife Rachel steals Laban's household gods, his teraphim, they're called. And then she pulls a stunt, she puts them under her saddle and sits down on her saddle and when they come in they say, well I can't get up, she says, I can't get up, I'm having my period. The woman having her period was unclean, so they couldn't actually pick her up. So um, and we have other examples where it appears the Israelites expected that there were other beings that could be worshipped. I believe those were other spiritual beings. There is only one eternal God. But there are other spiritual beings, created beings, particularly angels and demons. And demons, most particularly, have convinced human beings to worship them over time, at various times. Some of the gods that are forbidden in the Bible, Asherah, Baal, uh, Dagon, the god of the Philistines, the one that the, the temple that Samson destroyed, Chemosh, uh, which is Solomon because he married foreign wives. They had him set up worship places for Chemosh, Moloch. Um, those are demons, I believe, that were worshipped, but they were deities because deity means a, be a spiritual being that's worshipped. The Israelites recognized that there were other beings that could be worshipped, but they believed that there was one true great God, which means that's the definition of henotheism, not monotheism. I believe the reason we have two commandments there, and the reason I disagree with breaking with making them one, by the way, which Catholics and Anglicans and Lutherans do, is I believe that God says, You will have no other gods before me, I come first, not which is all which had been the case since Abraham. Okay, focus on me. But the second one is, not only am I the only, the God who comes first, you can't have any other gods now. You can't make any idols, you can't worship them of lesser deities. I think that's why we have one and two, is because the Israelites had been henotheists, believing there were other deities that could be worshipped, even though they had selected one. So, then, do not misuse the name of God, respect me, he's saying. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not covet. Now, there's all this, always this discussion about, and this is one of the reasons they break it up differently. Um, part of these laws have to do with how we are supposed to relate to God. Part of them have to do with how we're supposed to relate with other people. Um, my belief is that the first five have to do with relating to God, and the second five have to do relating with, re with relating to other people. And you go, but wait a minute, number five is honor your father and your mother. I think that has to do with relating to God, because it's a matter of recognizing that God is God over even our biology. And it is God who made our parents, who gave our parents the ability to create us biologically, he gave them authority over us to raise us, to protect us, to provide for us. In effect, that our parents are our um, are, are God's representatives, God's uh, surrogates, if you will, in creating us and maintaining us up to a certain point. So I think number five actually has to do with God, our respect for God and for His plan, and is to respect that He is God over our biology as well. So anyway, these are the ten laws. While Moses is up on the mountain and getting the laws and everything, he comes back down. The Israelites, who have just experienced all of these blinking miracles, got so weirded out about him being up on the mountain and there's lightning and thunder and noise and they're scared. So they convince Aaron, who, duh, Aaron, agrees to make a golden <coughs> idol for them and they worship this golden idol. And so Moses comes back down the mountain, smacks them around, breaks the tablets that are the Ten Commandments. He gets another set later um, from God. Yes? Was the golden calf what they, uh, some of them worshipped in Egypt? Well, the calf, or the bull, is, a, is frequently a symbol for pagan gods, for Canaanite gods. Um, the, again, in the other class, I talked about some of those gods. The, the great god El was sometimes called the bull god. And so bulls or even calves frequently were considered symbols. So one of the one of the a lot of religions have had it. one of the competitive religions to Christianity in the first century was Mithraism, and their right sort of their baptism event in Mithraism. It was a, a Persian a warrior god that the Romans especially liked because he was a warrior. Um, their their baptism was a, called the Torah Bolium, Torah Taurus Bull. Because what they would do is they would have like a cave with a grate in it, and the, the new converts to Mithraism would 
be underneath this grate and they would bring a bull in, slash the bull's throat, and the blood would pour through this grate out of the people. That was their baptism because the strength of the bull. So the bull was often a symbol for pagan gods, and the calf is just a reflection of that. Okay, Bob. This is one thing I had a little bit of a hard time with because he's up on the mountain of God and <coughs> says, your people are down there making worship to golden calf. I'm right. really ticked off about this and I'm going to wipe them out. Yep. And Moses says, oh, don't do that, you know. And then God says, okay, I changed my mind. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> what is up with that? Um, there, uh, on the one hand, we believe that a basic doctrine of God is that God is unchangeable. Okay. God, that's part of being the I am, the non-contingency. He doesn't change. And yet we have several instances, this being perhaps the most dramatic one, in which we're told that God changed his mind. Uh, there's no perfect explanation for that. That's one of the mysteries. We have to recognize that. I think the, the, probably the best explanation for it is that God, um, God wanted to make a point with Moses and say, all right, I'm going to destroy these people. What do you think about that? And, God, and Moses says, you know, Moses, Moses has to make his case. He has to stand up for as the leader of these people. And if anything, it affirms him as being the one who is taking responsibility for them as leader because he's got tough days ahead. Right? Uh, the, the hardest part of what he's going to have to do in terms of his leadership of those people is yet to come, believe it or not. Previously, he dealt with Pharaoh, and he dealt with Pharaoh's army, but, but the, the screwy people who are the people of Israel, he's still going to have 40 years of having to struggle with those folks. And so I think this was God's way of saying, you know, Moses, see the fish or cut bait, I'll destroy him right now, and we'll move on. And the fact that Moses defended them, I believe, is what God was looking for. Okay. Now, I can't tell you absolutely that that's the case. That's how I, why I believe that. Because we do believe God is immutable, is the word that's used. That God does not change. He does not change his mind. And that there, when, he, when we have those examples, those are literary ways of, com of communicating to us something else that's going on behind that. But mostly it's a mystery. Well, I also think uh, that God has every right to be mad at them and to want to destroy them. But at the same time, God loves them. Right. God, God gets angry and wants to destroy them, but he loves them. Anybody here have children? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. He is our father. And yes. so I think that that's, you know, we, we can sort of understand that sometimes still. Okay. <laughs> any day. Any day. No. Um, so, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And, I, excuse me, but I am the good child. Yes. <laughs> well, they all say that. <laughs> yeah, they all say that. Um, can, I, can I say something? Sure. I think they would have more of a problem with Aaron because Aaron was taken up on the mountain with God. I mean, God, you know, no. Later. Later. No, well, not, a, not every time. Part of the time is just Moses. Right. Yeah. But God, Our, and Joshua actually is involved in this some too, as, as Moses' is assistant. In but the I thought being. God had Moses bring Aaron up on the mountain before. Uh, not took, every time. No, Aaron was down below. Making the golden calf while Moses was up on the mountain. Had he already gone up on the mountain? Uh, I think he had. I'd have to look at the timeline in terms of where he was on that. I mean, I God, think he, God I think chose. He had already gone up on the mountain. I think he had already gone up on the mountain, and then he goes down and he lets the people talk him into making the golden calf. Well, he knew better I think than he that. He would have been taken to the woodshed. Either way, he knew better. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's part of the Israelites that had to suffer. In fact, Aaron dies. Aaron and Miriam, who were who were older, mm -hmm. Moses was younger. Mm -hmm. They died earlier. You know, they died um, early on in numbers before before they get close to the promised land. Russ? I heard it suggested when I was at a Bible study of um, people who thought they were Hebrews. They were Christians, but they thought by being grafted in meant that they had to keep all the law, law, laws of the Bible. And they Which said, is wrong, by the way. Yes, but they said that when they were making, or this was one of the suggestions, because we were doing the Torah study, that when they were making the golden calf, they were making an image of God. And Aaron let them do it because they'd always worshipped things. And now God is just a pillar of fire. Yes, uh, uh, and they want something to worship. And so he went along with it because 
he thought, well, you know, it's better the more than all rebelling and they wanted to go back to, to Egypt. So he thought, well, what's really the harm in it? Let them make an image. If they want to worship an image in the name of God rather than an image that was not God. Well, that's perhaps true because, you, again, in the other class, those of you who were there, the great god of the Canaanite pantheon, the high god of the Canaanite pantheon, was the god El. Mm -hmm. The Hebrews, and he's described like Yahweh. I mean, he is the yeah. creator of everything else, of all people, of all gods, of all nature. He is compassionate. He cares for the needy. He's the righteous judge. All, all kinds of things. So much so that when the, when the Israelites were exposed to Canaanite religion, they took El, E-L, is the way we transliterate it, um, as being a generic word for God. Mm -hmm. And some of the popular names in the Old Testament for God that we carry over, like El Shaddai, El Olam, uh, the everlasting one, El Elyon, um, those, are, those are directly adopted, sort of um, taken over from the Canaanite worship of the god El. And this is the primary symbol for El was a bull. So it's, it, it does make sort of sense that they had kind of adopted some of this stuff, and then they were thinking, well, give us an image. Mm -hmm. And some of them, some of them course. may actually have thought, well, it's an image of the God that Moses is up there interacting with, who's scared us to death. By. Whether that was what they were thinking, or whether they actually thought they were worshiping some other God, it was a really bad idea, and God made that clear to them. Mm -hmm. But he didn't wipe them all out. No. Well, going back, well, just, going back just, a wee, just a wee bit, Moses was a type of Christ. Therefore, he was an intercessor as Christ is interceding right now for us. Right. He, exactly, and he was, uh, he embodied the redemption of God. It was through, and, and remember I told you, Father, Redeemer, King? Mm -hmm. Moses was seen as the Redeemer. He not only was the giver of the law, which is how we think of him, but he was the one that God used to bring them up out of captivity in Egypt. So he was the Redeemer. So, join, um, some. The image, making the image, he hadn't yet brought this tablet down to say they could not make an image. Right. That's good yeah, and, and as I say, I believe that up until one and two of the Big Ten, um, they didn't. They were not clearly instructed. They weren't supposed to do that. So there was something in their hearts that was wrong yeah, with this. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's keep going. So that this is this is what happens. Moses gets angry, breaks the tablets, etc. Uh, then the next major event we have is the building of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. This is the portable temple for God, is what the tabernacle is. From Exodus 25, the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. By the way, this is the passage, one of the passages I referred to in um, the sermon on Sunday. Uh, is it 25 or 35? I thought it was 30. Anyway, I guess this is right. The Lord said to Moses, um, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. Notice it's the heart they would give from. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long. Remember, a cubit is a foot and a half. Two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold uh, molding around it. I'm reading from the computer, I don't have to print it out. Cast four gold rings for it, and fasten them to the four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of the ark, they are not to be removed. Then put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. The testimony is the tablets of the Ten Commandments the covenant. Okay. Now, um, this is a layout, sort of a diagram of what the ark of the, uh, of the tabernacle would have been. I'll show you pictures in a minute. But there would have been tent all the way around here, the outside, just fabric walls. Uh, then there is the holy place and the holy of holies, or most holy place with, a, again, a covering. This is like a, a tent with a roof on it. The measurements, there's a brass laver, bra, uh, bronze altar. There is a uh, table for showbread, a lampstand, an altar uh, for incense, and then the Ark of the Covenant here. Uh, one reason I use this diagram is that God also gave them instructions as to where the 12 tribes were to camp around the tabernacle. So that was the center 
from this point on of the Israelites' uh, existence. They literally camped around it with three tribes on each side. Moses, Aaron, and, the son, and their sons were on this side with Zebulun, Judah, and Issachar. On the north side with um, Naphtali, Asher, and Dan were the families of Merari, which is one of the families of the Levite tribes. Over here you get Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin with the families of the Gergeshites, uh, or the Gershonites, excuse me. Here Gad, Simeon, and Reuben with the families of Kohath. Kohath. These families here were the Levites. Three different families from the Levites. Okay, yes? Um, I have a, a question about Manasseh and Ephraim. You know, why were they not called just the tribe of Joseph? But I know he, he gave them a double portion Correct. to his kids, but none of the other sons lost their name of their tribe. And I don't know. Well, Joseph was honored as one of the patriarchs when none of his brothers were. I mean, if we study the four patriarchs, Joseph is the only one who was considered a patriarch in the same line as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we didn't lose that. And it's because Joseph was so important that he was given a double share. And when we say double share, that means something when they're getting ready to go into the Holy Land. They're going to divide up the land and give each family land. And he gets twice as much because, or in terms of two different allotments because of his two sons. So it really was a good thing. It was a positive thing. And Joseph's name was not forgotten as he continued to be one of the patriarchs that they looked back to. Okay? All right. Uh, this is sort of a claymation model or whatever of what it might have looked like. You see, and there are very specific instructions for how this was to be done with fabric walls and how it was supposed to be tied down and the colors that were supposed to be used in the fabric of the, of the opening. Uh, of the various pieces of furniture that were to be there, the labor, or C, um, you know, and then this is the, the uh, holy, uh, the holy of holies and the uh, holy place. This is what it would look like inside that. It was broken in two sections. This would have been the, the um, holy place and the most holy place, sometimes called the holy of holies, with the, the various uh, furnishings in it, and it was separated by a curtain or a veil that were all beautifully woven in purples and reds and gold and things of that. So for a tent, this was pretty classy because this was where God was going to live. They literally, God said to them, I will be present here and you take this with you and wherever you can and you set this up, this is an indication that I'm present with you. In fact, I've got a drawing here, a diagram here of this is what it would look like surrounded by the Israelites. It's kind of dark. And you'll know. We mentioned a minute ago that God went with the Israelites in the cloud by day. There was a cloud that followed them. And at night, it was a pillar of fire. And so this would have been what it was like at night with the tabernacle uh, compound, the holy place and the holy of holies, and the idea here, this artist is represented, that God in the pillar of fire resided. You know, it's like one of his feet is in the holy of holies on the Ark of the Covenant. That's how that is represented. Okay. Uh, Ross, what, one thing that struck me at this time was these were such complex, detailed instructions. Okay. How were they passed down, and how critical is that to our understanding? How did he get that detail transcribed or transmitted to all of the different people that put this together? Well, Moses was the boss. I mean, Moses was the was the anointed by God to be the leader of the Israelites. He's the one that God gave this to. So it was through Moses that he selected supervisors. You know, there were two, two primary he, people. Was, was he able to recall all of this mm -hmm. verbally? Because there was no audio recording. Well, but he, he also <clears throat> wrote it down. I mean, we have that, that he did write it down for, for us at some point. Okay. But yeah, it's also true that back then, um, it was, while they had writing, they did write things, it was still predominantly an oral culture, which means people did remember things. You know, it's very strange to us to realize that um, even during the time of Socrates, we think of Socrates as the great philosopher, Socrates was opposed to writing because he said, if people learn to write, they won't remember anything. One for Socrates. Okay. The idea being that... Um, Back then, they heard things, they remembered them, they recited them, they memorized them because it was an oral culture. Even though they had writing, and, and we know that, and we know we believe Moses could write, or Moses did write, 
Still, he came from a culture where you important stuff, you didn't forget it. Okay, David? What is the critical uh, justification for all this minutia? Um, why all the minutia, for those who didn't hear what he said? Why all of the fine details? For me, it's very simply a matter of um, this is important. All right, I want you to be very particular <coughs> about this because this is important. If he just said, hey guys, uh, make me a tent. Okay. It's a tent. We've all got tents. Not a big deal. The fact that God told them to use valuable material, to build it in a very specific set of dimensions, in a very specific way, I believe the whole point of all of that was in order to reinforce the fact that this is important. That this we are doing not for not for Bob or Bill or Jim or me or you know we're doing this for God and we got to get it right and it's very exacting work to get it right right like anything else what's the difference in fine craftsmanship that's valuable and stuff that's just schlocked together a lot of it has to do with the details God is in the details as they say Gene. Was there any theological significance to the fact that once the poles were put into the rings on the ark, they should never be removed? Not well. It could be similar to with the Exodus. They, you know, he said, "Don't make bread with yeast in it because you don't have time for it to rise." Make sure you got your walking shoes on. You know, tuck your you know, tuck your uh, uh, robe in your belt so that it's not going to get in the way of your legs. The idea that you got to be ready to move when I tell you to. That's probably what that was about. During this whole time, part of God's message to them was, you aren't settling down yet. You haven't arrived. There is yet some place for you to be. Putting the poles in the Ark of the Covenant and not taking them out was an indication that we can pick this up and move whenever God tells us to. I'm, I'm guessing. That's my interpretation of that. Sarah? Wasn't it also because if they touched it, they would die? Well, they do, we do have examples where people who touched it, in fact, there's a, there's a place where David gets mad at God because somebody touches the Ark of the Covenant to try to try to steady it as they're carrying it, and they're, and they're stricken dead, and David gets mad at God over that and says, why did you do that? You know, he was trying to help. But again, it comes back to that issue of holiness. You don't just grab something that represents God's presence on earth, that there's a very particular set of rules associated with this. Now, I don't know why the guy died. But I do know that one of the reasons why those those things were God was so particular about those things is that this is holy. This is holiness on earth. This is the presence of the one true God in your midst. Take this seriously, people. Okay. Isn't that reinforced later on when there's like two guys that don't uh, worship exactly like God says, and they're, we're talking about minor things that right. they do differently, and then they are. Well, they started. They started. Uh, they, they. There's a question about that. They. They brought forth fire, yeah. that was not approved of, and we don't know if that meant that they tried to, outside their authority, that they tried to light the fire in the labor or in the the. Um, uh, you know, there was a fire pit in the in the, the within the tabernacle grounds. Whether they did that and they weren't supposed to, that wasn't. Their assignment, or whether they actually were using fire was also a symbol for pagan worship. <coughs> whether they actually were doing something that was contrary to God, and they were they were condemned for it. You know, we don't know exactly because it doesn't give us the detail. But this, my question is, I I can see all the reverence and, and the obedience that they have to be done, but now we kind of have communion, kind of as a matter of fact. You know, there's nothing very. It's, a specific, a special, um, I don't know what uh, I'm trying to say. The <laughs> reverence. Right. You know, we just go there, have the communion, come to our seat, say thank you, Lord. Yeah. And that's it. Well, um, there's a trade off. The, uh, to have the balance between an awe and respect for God, and yet a sense in which He is Abba Father, that yeah. He has come to us. You know, he, he's come to us in the person of Jesus. He came to them. Remember, he started out walking with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day and talking with them. He was present to uh, Moses. He spoke to Abraham. I mean, God has had intimacy with those who follow him and serve him down through history. We've gone through periods of time which have been dark. 
where God, you know, for his own wisdom in his own wisdom and because of our failings, he has not been present. This is a time when the reason God said build this thing, and he was very particular how to build it, is because I, this is going to be my place of being right in your midst. I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to guide you. Remember, the, the reason why there was a cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is because they were following it. It was guiding them. God was saying, I am with you all the time. I am living in your midst. I am going to show you where to go and how to live. And so there was an intimacy to that. Yes, there was also a formality. There was a sense in which, you know, um, we, we couldn't get too familiar. But you know what? I don't think we should get too familiar today. He is still the great God. He, he has, in the person of Jesus, told us that he's not only God the Father Almighty, but he is also Abba. We do need to respect. That's why the second commandment, now the third commandment says, yeah, but don't misuse my name. Don't forget, I'm God, you're not. Have a little respect. I think that's part of it, too. That's why we have certain things. Um, an example, and it's not, I'm ordained, and uh, Arturo is not. Guillermo is not. So when we have communion in the uh, Spanish language congregation, I go and do the, the words of institution with the elements, and then we, we offer them together. That is simply a way of saying, you know, I spent quite a few years studying for ordination and have, you know, and uh, to, to get seminary degrees and to be ordained, and we want to respect the fact that this isn't, I had a friend once say, I can have communion with a hot dog and a Coke in a park just as easily as with, you know, and I, and I said, no, you can't. Because there is an aspect of holiness that we have to re pay regard to. There's not anything magical about the way we do it, but there is an aspect of respect to it. We're warned also to take it, to take it seriously. Yeah. seriously. But I know people that take communion every day in their homes by themselves. Yeah, and we don't. In fact, a Protestant wedding, you don't offer communion to the, to the couple. A Catholic wedding, you do. You know, the, the bride and groom take communion. Communion is a public event. It's a community event. It's not done by the individual people. Unless somebody is, is homebound or whatever, and the community can be taken to them. If they can't, get out. But not as a ceremony. Okay, I need to get on to something else, Carrie. One more thing. Uh, my question is, I was surprised God was not upset with Moses when he destroyed the tablets. I think I think it, Moses, uh, Moses was justifiably angry. And God yeah, didn't but get then mad. he destroyed something God just gave him. Yeah. It's from God. It's not from... Yeah, it's I mean, not like a little kid getting a toy and breaks it the first day. Well, I can't, I can't read God's mind, but I think God probably said, you know, make me mad too, Moses. I understand why you did that. I'll give you another set. You're okay. Don't worry about it. Well, I made him make it another set. Yeah. So I think it was that God, God, actually Moses' anger at this, his righteous anger, was consistent with how God felt about it, and so God hold it against him. All right. And it made the people. Yeah, they knew it was serious now. Yeah. It, it, it shook them up. This is a model of what the Ark of the Covenant, we believe, would have looked like. It's a little different than the one in like, Raiders of the Lost Ark, but not too, not too different. Um, this is a painting of Moses and um, Aaron worshiping at the Ark of the Covenant. I did this last where, night. Where no. was that photograph taken? <laughs> where was that photograph taken? Um, just, I mean, it's it's consistent. It is the, with the you see him with a jeweled vest, which is part of the, the vestments. This is a, just a, an old etching, uh, or uh, the, of when they would go to war, which is what's going on here. They would take the Ark of the Covenant out, and it would give them victory because it, it was the power of God. That looks like when they were going around the city. Jericho. Jericho. It, it might very well be because they've got the horns. You know, when, yeah. when Joshua, when they crossed the river of Jericho, was the first major city they came to. They walked around the city and they carried the Ark of the Covenant and they said, you know, six times, seven times, the seventh day they blew the horns and the walls came from the now. Uh, so that could be that. Okay. In the next ten minutes, we're going to cover the other three books. <laughs> and there's a reason for that, because Exodus really is the one. That Genesis lays all the foundation. Exodus sort of takes us on the path of God's covenant commitment to his people, the Israelites. Um, and the others are just sort of filling out. Um, things. The, the next book, which is Leviticus, is the book in which the law is expounded more. The law is more than just the, the Big Ten. It's more than just the Ten Commandments. There are over 600 particular laws in the Hebrew Bible. Some of them have to do with personal conduct. Some of them have to do with priestly conduct and how church is to be done. In the 
the Presbyterian Church, we, we have two, two documents. One of them is the Book of, of Confessions. It's sort of like there's statements of our faith in God. The second book is the Book of Order, which tells you how to do church. Well, the law is just like that. Some of them are statements of what our faith in God is and how we're supposed to live, and the other is what is the ritual? What is the, how, how do you do church? Written by Moses, same time period, it explains law and sacrifice. The key word, again, remember in Exodus, the key word was redemption, that God saved the Israelites. Here it is holiness. The purpose is to instruct Israel on how to be holy and to be a blessing to others. You will remember when we looked at the covenant commitments that God made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Every time he said, I am blessing you and through you, everyone else. He keeps saying that. The outline, first seven chapters are about sacrifice, then the priesthood, then clean and unclean things, the day of atonement, and then laws for daily life. This is how it breaks down, consistent with that other chart I gave you, and you all will have access to this. The focus, the first half is sacrifice, the second half is sanctification. Another way to look at that down in the division, uh, laws of sacrifice and laws of sanctification, or under topic rather, the way to God, how do you make yourself righteous before God? through sacrifice, and then how do you live in a righteous relationship with God, which is sanctification. The first section are the laws that are acceptable with regard to how you approach God. The second section are the laws that have to do with continued fellowship with God. And it has to do with offerings, consecrating priests, consecrating the people, uh, national atonement as part of sacrifice, and then under sanctification, the uh, rules for the people, for the priests, the rules for worship, uh, what to do in Canaan, and the vows that are to be taken. All of this happens at Mount Sinai, all in about a one-month period. It is the giving of the particular laws, how to become holy, and then how to remain holy in relationship with God. Now, the, and the law really breaks down for us into two parts. There is the moral law, and then there is the priestly law, if you will. The moral law, we are still bound to obey. As Christians. The moral law includes don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie about your neighbors or to your neighbors. The things that have to do with what is right and wrong in terms of, and also the, the rules about us relating to God in terms of him being our only God, etc. The priestly laws are the ones about how the Israelites particularly were to do their religion. You know, Offering sacrifices, eating certain foods and not eating other foods, utilizing certain implements, things that make you clean and unclean, and that sort of stuff. The priestly law, we are no longer under. We still have an obligation to obey the moral side of the law. Okay. Now, then we have the book of Numbers. As I said, it's called, and by the way, Leviticus, you know, Genesis is, means beginnings. Exodus means the, the exit, the leaving. Leviticus means the rules of the Levites, who are the priests. It has to do with the priestly law. The book of Numbers is called Numbers because twice in this book um, we have the big counting of people, the census, the poll to determine how many people are there. And that's where we have a question about is the, is the LF, is the word that's translated thousands, is that an accurate translation or does it represent some other unit, like clan or whatever. Um, again, by Moses, same time period, the theme is census and history, the key word is wanderings, because Numbers is the place where they spend 40 years wandering around in circles before they can actually get to the Holy Land, and I'll mention why in a second. The purpose is to show what can happen when God's people rebel against him. God will not be mocked. The outline, the first nine chapters have to do with the, the first census, then uh, three chapters deal with Sinai to Canaan, the traveling from Mount, uh, from Mount Sinai to uh, Canaan, then we have the story of the spies and rebellion, chapters 13 to 19, and the wandering around, and then the time at Moab before they enter the promised land, or getting ready to enter. Um, this sort of outline, you have the old generation, the people who actually came out of Israel, out of Egypt. You have the tragic transition, which is the 30 years in, or 40 years in the desert. It's not quite 40 years. They had 20 days of figuring out, you guys don't get it yet. Then they had um, the wandering in the desert. 
uh, the wilderness, and then five months in the plains of Moab as they're trying to get ready to cross over into the Promised Land. Um, Mount Sinai, the wilderness, and plains of Moab. So that's what Numbers is all about. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier on this map, they get, whether it's here or over here, Jebel, Jebel Al Laws is the other alternate location for Mount Sinai they actually have on this map. They wandered around from Kardesh Barnea and Barnea. They kept coming back there, wandering around, and finally to Ezion Geber. And then up here, through Edom, and the Edomites are all forever cursed because they attack the rear guard. The, the people who were slowest and weakest and were traveling along in the back of the, of the caravans uh, for the Israelites, the Edomites attacked them. The Israelites asked them for mission to travel through their land. They said no, and then they were picking off the stragglers. The Edomites were cursed for that forever. And then up through Moab, and here is where Mount Nebo, the area where they're hanging out at the end of, of Numbers, getting ready to cross over into the Promised Land. And Mount Nebo is where Moses goes up, and he can look across, uh, we're told in Deuteronomy, to see the Promised Land, but he is not allowed to go there because of an act of disobedience he committed. God told him to go up and speak to a rock, and Moses decided he was going to show off. He, he hit the rock with his staff and shouted at it, and as though it were by his authority that this were happening and not by God's. And God said, Moses, I love you, but you're going to pay a price for that. It's one more act of disobedience and rebellion. And, you know, you're not in charge here, ultimately. And God said the punishment is that you're not going to cross over. Now, he was 120 years old and he died. So it's not like God cut his life short. But he did not have the opportunity to enter the promised land. Okay. Uh, that's, that's the wrong heading. It should be the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, the last of the five books of Moses, are actually three sermons by Moses. Because again, they're in Moab. Um, Moses is restating all of the previous generation that had left Egypt is dead, with the exception, Moses, who dies before they cross over, Joshua and Caleb. When they were in the wilderness, one of the things that they did was... Um, Moses sent 12 spies up into Canaan to spy out the land. When they came back, they all agreed it was a land flowing with milk and honey, just like God said. There were great crops, there were watered plains. Now, not all of Israel is like that, not all of Canaan, but there are sections um, of it that uh, the, the Sharon Valley and other areas that are absolutely gorgeous. You know, they grow very plentiful, great crops. I mean, if you've ever been to parts of, or seen pictures of parts of Israel, and it looks like why do they want to go there? Well, there are parts of them that are spectacular in terms of fertile and whatnot. And so the 12 spies came back. Ten of them said, yeah, it's beautiful, but there are giants in the land. They have fortified cities. They have great armies. There's no way we can win this. We cannot do this. Only Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can, because God said we can. And God will win for us. Because of that rebellion, and the fact that immediately following that, people rebelled against Moses, and they wanted to go, you know, they wanted to leave. Uh, actually, at one point, there's 250, I think it's 250, if I remember right, leaders, the Kohathite rebellion, who rise up and want to overthrow Moses. At one point, even Miriam and, and uh, Aaron are against Moses. And through this various opposition, not just because of the... the people not wanting to try because the ten spies said not to, but also because of their opposition to Moses and their failure to recognize that they're there because God brought them there and they're, they're supposed to enter the land because God told them to. That's why they spent 40 years wandering around in the desert. So, um, here at the bottom, the outline, Sermon 1, Moses re re uh, replays where they've come from and all that has happened to them in the past. The second sermon, which begins in the fifth chapter, he reviews the law for them. That's why it's called Deuteronomy. Wrong heading, it's the book of Deuteronomy, not the book of Numbers. Uh, Deuteronomy, the second, Dudo, the second telling of the law. Then the covenant is restated, reaffirmed for this new generation. These, were these people were children when they first came out of Egypt. Some of them have been born since they left Egypt, while they were in the wilderness. And so the covenant is restated for them, and then final farewells before Moses' death. This sort of lays it all out. They're all in the plains of Moab. It's only about a one-month period of time. It has to do with what God has done, the historical past, first sermon. 
what God expects of Israel in terms of the, the, uh, the laws, the restating of the law, the second sermon, and then what God will do, the prophecy of taking of the land and the renewal of the covenant that he will bless the Israelites with. Okay? Any questions about that? Exodus is, you know, Genesis, Exodus, they're the real heart. They're the most important parts of, um, for us. If you were a Levitical priest, you might think Leviticus was the most important. But for us, that's the most important part, so that's what I concentrate on. For us? Uh, says that um, on page, page 79, he also, most of the revealed unique facts about the promised land, which would be referred to again and again, the land could not be irrigated like the land of Egypt. I can understand that. Yep. With the River Jordan hundreds of feet below sea level. Right. What part of the River Jordan is he referring to? Because the River Jordan ran, or what part of the Promised Land? Because I thought the Promised Land ran from above the Sea of Galilee down. It does. In fact, if you want to look in that book on page 81, yeah. it's got an outline. The so, Sea of Chinnereth is the Sea of Galilee on this. Yeah. Street. So okay. the River, the River Jordan. It goes downhill. The Salt Sea. Yeah, it goes down to the Salt Sea, but the Jordan... Dead, is the Dead Sea. That's yeah. the lowest place on the planet. But the majority of the River Jordan is above way above sea level. Uh, I mean, it runs down. It yeah. runs down from the Sea of Galilee. From, yeah. Much of it is below sea level, because the, the Dead Sea is over 300 feet below sea level, which is called the Salt yeah. Sea on this. And so, you can't... The, the, what he's saying is that with the technology that they had available to them, um, gravity prevented you from using the Jordan River to irrigate very much. Now there are areas closer to the coast, there's a ridge of mountains that go in between the Jordan River and the coast. And there's a natural um, phenomena that clouds would come in, would blow in from the sea, would hit that ridge of mountains, even though they're not huge mountains, and they would drop their water. And so the, the really fertile places are naturally watered and they are closer to the, the, the shore. Valley of uh, uh, Sharon, and there's another name that's not coming to my mind, right? I'll think of it later. And so, and that phenomenon, by the way, if you're all for, or from Washington State or if you know Washington State, Western Washington, very wet. Everybody talks about how much it rains there. Eastern Washington is what? Desert. It's a desert. Why? Because the, the, mountain, the winds come in from the sea and they bring the clouds, they hit the mountains, okay, the Cascade Mountains drop all of their moisture on the west side so that the east side is desert. It has to be irrigated. They grow a lot of vineyards and stuff like that there now, but that's all irrigated land. The same thing is true in, same same thing is true in Israel. In California and Nevada. Well, same thing is true in California and Nevada. That phenomenon that mountains usually on the windward side, the side that the wind comes from, usually has natural water. The other side tends to be very dry because clouds drop their water when they hit a mountain range. All the things we get into. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes, Joanne. I just hit me that it's interesting they've wandered for 40 years, so the young people are the ones born will wander, and then yep. suddenly plops them in a land. Yep. How hard that, that transition had to have been for them to say, what? Well, and they didn't settle immediately. They still had a lot of fighting of battles and stuff like that. You know, there's still a lot of conversation going on about what we're actually going to. And, and they would take over towns, you know, they would conquer towns, and sometimes they would stay in the towns. But there's, there's still, you know, during the period of the judges, there's still a whole lot of kind of settling in. <laughs> okay, for next week, your reading assignment in Ben Ware's book, if you have that book. And again, I recommend the reading for everybody, but it's a requirement for people who are doing this for a certificate or degree. Ben Ware's book, page 82 to 131. I want you to read the book of Joshua. And the book of 1 Samuel, I was accused last week of, of telling you you had to read the whole Pentateuch in a week, and I didn't. I told you to read Exodus and only six chapters of Deuteronomy, BD. I'll show you the slide. So, I want you to read Joshua and Samuel, and then the introductory materials to Ruth, 2 Samuel, and 1 and 2 Kings. If, if you are one of the anointed of God, you might read all of that. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to require that for you. Okay. 
read all of Joshua and all of 1 Samuel and then the introductory material, that is if you have a study Bible, you know, the introductory material would be the introduction, so that you know generally what it's about and who wrote it and when it was written and that kind of stuff. And we'll talk about that next week. Any questions? God bless you all. Thanks for being here.